from accelerated innovation cycles to reduced costs, the benefits of cloud-native development are well known. But how do you unleash its full power for maximum value for your organization? What do you need to know about leveraging serverless technologies to unlock the potential of cloud-native development? Hello, and welcome to this audio webcast titled, Unleashing the Power of Cloud-Native with Serverless, brought to you by Capgemini and IDG. My name is Tom Schmidt, Digital Content Director at IDG Strategic Marketing Services, and I'll be the moderator of today's webcast. Joining me is Ravi Ganta, Delivery Architect Director at Capgemini. Ravi is an expert in AWS, cloud migrations, cloud modernization, digital transformation, and large-scale cloud applications. Hello, Ravi. Hi, Tom. How are you? Great. Also joining me is Matt Braleyberger, Senior Serverless Business Development Manager at AWS. With over 20 years of experience in software architecture, project management, development, and software quality, Matt is currently part of the AWS Serverless Business Development Team. Welcome, Matt. Awesome. Hey, thanks, Tom. Robbie, you and Matt plan to cover quite a bit of ground with respect to cloud native and serverless. Let's begin by setting the agenda for our audience. Thank you so much, Tom. Today, we're going to talk about cloud native overview, uh, some of the key tenets, business drivers of cloud native, followed by different deployment models for cloud native on AWS platform. We will also cover serverless, uh, advantages of serverless, some of the benefits of serverless, and also some of the um, uh, considerations for serverless platform. Uh, we will follow up with uh, commonly asked questions, and then we'll cover some of Capgemini's accelerators as we help our customers um, make this transition to cloud native in an accelerated fashion. What are some of the business drivers for cloud native? Businesses want to do uh, things faster, uh, sooner in response to the challenges from their uh, competition and their customers' expectations. They want to be agile. They want to innovate fast, as in they think about a concept, a new concept, a new idea of an offer, for example, and they want to deliver that within weeks, not months. And that is possible with cloud native. They want to be able to deliver applications to scale. Uh, this also means that they want to be able to scale up and scale down and also just pay for usage, not necessarily pre-procure. Uh, security is a key aspect uh, that continues to be a significant factor for enterprises. We want to be able to build applications that are resilient to failure, even if there is a power cut in a certain region or a certain location. We want the application uh, to perform just as well and service the customers. Um, we want to be able to be cognizant of cost. We want to be able to be flexible. And we want to be able to leverage the latest technologies that uh, AWS platform offers natively. All these drivers uh, are possible to be addressed with cloud native uh, platform. Now, cloud native is a, has been in the industry for uh, several years, three, four years for sure. Um, but there are some key pillars uh, that drive cloud native innovation. Uh, one of them is DevSecOps or DevOps, where code-centric approach to software engineering and infrastructure becomes a key aspect. As you know, cloud native applications are typically distributed network applications, unlike um, monolithic applications. Uh, therefore, they come in with a level of complexity. In order to deliver complexity and agility in order to address complexity and deliver agility, uh, we utilize DevOps uh, uh, discipline. Uh, another key uh, aspect of this is containerization, ability to decouple software runtimes from infrastructure components, gives you that additional capability to leverage without regard to what infrastructure uh, the software is running on. Infrastructure as code is another key aspect, key pillar, uh, that allows uh, software organizations to uh, create ephemeral environments uh, and create immutable environments that allow you allow you to repeatedly deliver software to different environments and test them out before we go live. It's a very important aspect. And the lastly, uh, one of the key developments is microservices architecture. It's a pattern in which uh, large monolithic applications can be uh, broken up into small domain-centric services, 
and these domain centric services can then be deployed independently for, uh, from each other so you get agility a significant component of agility comes from being able to deliver these microservices in an independent manner so how do how, how does aws platform allow uh, microservices to be deployed there are multiple ways in this this can be done and this platform has evolved over years so we start with serverless which is the core topic of our uh, conversation today serverless is a zero infrastructure procurement environment where most of the focus can just directly go towards uh, building business focused services and not worrying about uh, what infrastructure it would run on uh, how, how do we procure that infrastructure how do we plan for it how do we cost for it and how do we optimize for it aws pretty much does all the heavy lifting for us and the businesses can uh, leverage uh, their time make best use of their time just by developing code that makes sense for their business and not worry about the heavy duty infrastructure aspect another aspect another way to deploy microservices is uh, ecs ecs is a platform that aws native it's a container orchestration framework that allows for dockerized containers or any other containerized applications to be run uh, in a very flexible manner it allows for orchestration and it has slightly uh, slightly increased overheads as compared to serverless but it is fully uh, managed by aws uh, another flavor of microservices that we often see customers go through and those who have adopted microservices very early on is uh, running them on uh, kubernetes kubernetes is a container orchestration engine uh, it's an open source uh, platform that's very uh, very popular and the uh, the upside of kubernetes is that you get utmost flexibility and control over the platform uh, but it also comes with complexity so organizations that are very mature uh, in handling microservices who have the devops uh, culture embedded in their uh, organizations are able to handle uh, kubernetes on native ec tools uh, there is a flavor of this that is a managed control plane version of it where aws provides eks which is a Kubernetes service control plane as a managed platform. That is another variation of it, where uh, where uh, companies do not have to worry about the control plane, where it's AWS managed. Typically, uh, we what we see our customers go through is a combination of serverless and uh, containerized microservices deployment. We'll get into the details of where which approach makes sense, but uh, generally. We are noticing in the industry that hybrid approach is very common, where it's leaning more and more towards serverless as organizations understand how to uh, do microservices. I'm going to pass it over uh, to Matt, who is going to cover the advantages of serverless. Awesome. Thanks, Robbie. So serverless is definitely one of those things uh, that's helping our customers get stuff out much more quickly uh, than traditional architectures. But I think quite right to what Ravi was saying, that we're seeing a lot of folks looking at this hybrid approach um, for using serverless to extend some capabilities that may exist inside containers. And regardless of how you're building out your architecture, I think when you look at the advantages of serverless, the number one thing that we hear from customers is just greater agility in general. Um, I can focus on the stuff that's most important to my business, the stuff that really differentiates me, um, as opposed to having to do a whole bunch of other things, stuff, we'll say, to actually provision the environment to actually run code, which ultimately represents uh, some form of our business and the business logic. Uh, we're definitely seeing lower total cost of ownership as a whole, again, because we're able to focus on the stuff that's very unique to our business as a whole. And while there are, of course, no servers that you would necessarily have to worry about, as an end user and end consumer, of course, there are servers behind the scenes. It's just what you're doing is having AWS manage a lot of those efforts. You're not having to worry about runtimes or flexible scaling, and of course, you're paying for value. And that's one of the interesting things about serverless. Rather than having something like an application server in, as a part of your architecture waiting to respond to some sort of a thing, but being on and, and you having to pay for it during that whole process, serverless only runs when something needs to be run. So an event-driven architecture, I'll talk about that in just a moment here. But more importantly, when something isn't required to be run, you're not having to have that running in the background and thus you're not paying for it. So it, we find that just developers love the space. You're able to get to building code much more quickly. Code, again, represents our business. Um, and again, serverless does provide a lot of other structures 
um, to, that tend to enforce things like good coding behavior, because again, you're only focused on specific portions of the business logic in your application, um, as opposed to things like load balancers or other server architectures behind it. And so we sit back and you look at uh, just overall considerations when you're trying to build an application. This has been true throughout the years, definitely today, but certainly in the past as well. Um, my goal is typically to run application code. Code represents an interaction with my customer. It represents some automation of my business process. But in order to do that, I had to have a runtime. I needed a guest operating system. I needed virtualization, perhaps, of an operating system. Even a container helps to some degree, but there's still work that I have to do ultimately. Uh, and of course, a physical infrastructure. Um, these were things typically when we were looking at an on-premise implementation that you would be responsible for. So if you look at the early days before cloud really became pervasive, companies would maybe run their own data centers and you had concerns around pool, uh, cooling, power and overall facilities. You had to manage physical security, virtualization if you were leveraging virtual resources and so forth. So there's a lot of stuff that was required and is required to get to the state where you're actually able to build software. And this is really where serverless comes in is we begin to remove a lot of these other um, concerns. And they still exist, but they're now the concerns of AWS. They're things that don't really differentiate your business because other folks, other customers in similar spaces are going to have these similar considerations. Um, and so I remember back in the days when I was doing a lot of uh, work at a telecommunications company, I would have to spend quite a bit of time sort of begging, borrowing, and, and trying to at least uh, negotiate to get access to resources to prove out an idea. And often that could take quite a bit of time. So the cost and the effort required to even prove an idea, do some level of innovation was, was quite high. And especially in these modern times where we have to have the business agile to be able to support new ways to engage with customers, I don't want to be limiting how um, I create innovation inside my company. I want everybody to be able to just show a good idea very quickly with a low cost, low effort. And that's ultimately what we're providing with serverless is that the developers can begin working at code. Um, I don't have to worry about pre-provisioning a whole bunch of stuff. And on top of that, I don't have additional considerations related to things like security. Um, of course, I have application security as a consideration. That was always a consideration. But what I'm having to now worry about is just the business logic and developing the code. And so being able to try out something new, being able to innovate really is an easy way for me able to, to use serverless to get something done. Um, where otherwise I would have had quite a bit of a, an impediment in the past. So again, what we're talking about here is really removing a lot of the undifferentiated heavy lifting here. So really my responsibility as an end user of this environment is the application code and the security uh, parameters related to that. So I mentioned the idea of an event-driven architecture. Um, so code is a piece of my application. In a lot of cases, uh, what we tend to find is that applications that customers build in a microservices or even a serverless microservice architecture leverage things like Lambda or Fargate for compute, but need other things like data stores and, of course, event integration to round out my offering. Think of it like a bunch of Lego blocks being assembled together to build a pirate ship. Um, things like maybe uh, Aurora serverless, things like Amazon uh, DynamoDB as ways to actually serverlessly manage uh, persistent data inside my application itself. But there's also other event integrations that really round out this ability for me to build a modern architecture using serverless. These are also what we would call uh, fully managed services. And what that means is that all of the services you're seeing here, and there are more that we're developing, including integrations and other third parties, these scale up and down automatically. So I don't have to worry about leaving these things hanging around in the background where I'm maybe having to go get billed for something where it's really not adding a whole lot of value. Um, as I no longer require these capabilities, these services disappear. And so I'm not having to pay for those. Uh, commonly, we see uh, API gateway connected to something like Lambda to provide authentication and throttling for my application, and then maybe leverage things like message queues like SQS to help with durability and stability. If you have an Alexa at home, that is Lambda running behind the scenes, and that is quite serverless. So what we're seeing, again, is that this idea of serverless is really an architectural decision that really supports microservices development. And where possible, what we're finding customers getting benefit from is leveraging these fully managed services so that they can focus on the stuff that is unique to their own business. I'll pass things back over to here to Robbie. Thank you so much, Matt. So well said. Um, we see serverless to be um, picking up uh, in the uh, enterprise world. Uh, we see that uh, there is a lot of traction in critical business critical applications with serverless. Having said that, there are some important considerations that uh, organizations should think about. Serverless is not a solution for all scenarios. For example, 
if you have workloads that require fine grained control over the type of CPU you want, the type of memory requirements you want, or a specific combination thereof, then serverless may not be the ideal choice. Okay, you may want to think about a hybrid architecture where if you want, if you have workloads that have CPU specific needs, um, you, you may want to have, uh, you think about, think about uh, non-serverless only approaches. Uh, there is another thing about cold start with, uh, with lambdas or serverless generally is that uh, there is a upfront cost, a few seconds uh, cost to uh, starting and kickstarting the functions on the server. So this latency is something that you need to consider if you're building high, uh, very low latency applications, uh, 10, sub 10 millisecond response time requirements. Uh, those are applications you may want to test out serverless on first check for scale, check for uh, your response times before you adopt it. So this is some things that we learned from experience so that we're happy to share with you. Another thing uh, that uh, most organizations that are uh, that are not mature enough run into is uh, adopt serverless because it offers all these great advantages, but realize later on that they're, they're working on some uh, anti-patterns like um, Lambda chaining, for example, not thinking carefully about IP address allocations, not thinking carefully about lambdas calling other lambdas or other third party um, services. So you have to be uh, having the right knowledge base and uh, uh, architectural experience in adopting serverless patterns. So just a quick call out to make sure that uh, the training part, the education part is in place before you onboard serverless. The last thing I've seen our customers struggle with is the ability to understand the cost and benefit ahead of time. Like most enterprise uh, enterprise organizations trying to build software, you want to create some kind of a TCO. And what uh, more and more what we see is that cost is becoming a quality parameter in the architecture space itself. Uh, given this, uh, it, it's a relatively harder, a relatively harder to do cost estimation on serverless generally because you have to have a lot more information about the throughputs, the loads, the uh, usage, the volumes, and so on in order to do a good solid cost estimation. So the tools are improving, uh, but this is something you want to pay careful attention to before you blindly uh, adopt serverless for all uh, applications. I want to uh, next speak about a very interesting uh, case study. Um, this is interesting for many reasons. Uh, Cortiva is a $14, $15 billion uh, annual revenues division. Uh, it's an agri-science company. Uh, they selected Capgemini to solve a few critical problems. A, the genome sequencing problem uh, is becoming more and more and more relevant in the industry today. And the cost for processing needs to reduce. The duration for doing the sequencing should reduce. And they want to be able to do it in an economical manner, right? Uh, the obvious choice was to do uh, a, a migration from their uh, on-prem infrastructure to cloud, which we did. Uh, but the not so obvious thing was uh, to actually select serverless over a regular containerized application. So in this, even though it's a compute-heavy uh, uh, genome sequencing type workload, we kind of pushed the boundary on this to leverage AWS uh, Lambda as our core application runtime. And we did it successfully along with our automated DevOps CI-CD platform. And together uh, with our customer, we were able to reduce the um, uh, time uh, processing time of 30 days on-prem to a one day uh, in the cloud. That is 30x reduction in time. And not only that, we are able to deploy uh, a new code uh, to the serverless uh, environments uh, in as quickly as days as opposed to months in the past. So this is a great case study. This also made it to reInvent, so we'll be happy to share with you some links uh, about if you want to learn more about this case study. Now we're going to the FAQ section. Thanks, Robbie. It is indeed time for the FAQ segment of our webcast, and we have time for a few questions. Robbie, you alluded to this one earlier. What's the difference between containers and serverless technologies? Great question, Tom. We get asked this question uh, a lot. We covered uh, some aspects of this in the past. Uh, so containers is a way of 
deploying more heavy duty uh, uh, applications long running applications um, that have that require fine grained control of the compute and memory uh, whereas serverless is uh, a simpler application development platform that allows organizations to go uh, go to market much quicker uh, without having to worry about the infrastructure uh, procurement components of it. Having said this, not all applications are suitable for serverless, not all applications are suitable for containers. We talked about majority of our customers leveraging a hybrid model uh, and uh, maturing towards serverless more and more, right? Um, so I hope that answers the question, uh, Tom. Thank you. There's another one for you, Ravi. What are some of the common issues that organizations face with Lambda? Wow, this is interesting. So we, we spoke about Lambda not being a solution for all, but Lambda is really uh, good for organizations that are making a cloud-first application development. For example, greenfield applications. We see a lot of adoption of serverless for greenfield applications. Where there are brownfield applications, legacy applications, moving legacy applications directly to serverless is a little bit of a lift for most organizations. So I would exercise caution in doing the direct transformation from a direct legacy application directly to uh, serverless. Another aspect of Lambda that I would uh, certainly think about is the cost element. We want to be able to build efficient cost models and which we help our customers with. And if you if you underestimate the cost of utilizing Lambda for some of those high throughput applications, you will be in for a surprise. So you want to be able to keep that in mind as you adopt Lambda. Those are a couple of call outs I can think about. Got it. Matt, let me follow up with you on that point what are the what are the differences with managing serverless for greenfield and migrated apps yeah that's a great question so i think uh, serverless in general tends to lend itself really well for anything that's greenfield because there's no none of the technical debt that typically uh, causes a, a little bit of challenge or, or some pause for organizations i think when we look at migrated applications still a good fit in some instances for serverless what we find that tends to drive a lot of those decisions is really the business more than anything else. Not that, not the technology, but the business. And so we look at the existing application and we begin to peel off the parts that are really impeding the business first and foremost. It's sometimes called incremental refactoring. Um, and so we do have customers in both, both sort of segments, but I think more importantly, when you're looking at an existing application, there's always risk in redeveloping something. And so it's, it's really making sure that you've got an alignment around the business cases um, and that what you're doing really targets the business versus of course, Greenfield being a whole lot easier, I think, because you don't have a lot of that technical debt. Got it. Another one for you, Matt, and this is a this is a big one. What are some of the latest cloud native trends? Yeah, definitely. Now, that's uh, <laughs> there's a lot of stuff going on. I think right now, um, event driven architectures. I sort of gave a little bit of a talk about that earlier. Here um, is one of the things that we're seeing um, becoming a lot more pervasive. Uh, microservices in general. I wouldn't say they're the latest trends, but microservices working with event-driven architectures are really a good way for organizations to get that speed and that time to market, but also at the same time, making sure that you're only paying for the resources that are being consumed. I think in general, obviously, uh, AI, ML, and anything that we can do related to that within the cloud is also a part of that. And I think serverless has uh, definitely an architectural consideration in that as well. Thanks, Matt. Great point. Ravi, you mentioned earlier some cloud native accelerators that Capgemini has developed for your customers. Could you elaborate on them? Absolutely, Tom. Uh, today, I have uh, I want to talk about three different accelerators that we have, uh, starting with uh, Capgemini's Pod as a Service model. This is a Capgemini uh, developed approach to quickly onboarding our customers to uh, benefiting from DevOps uh, culture. Uh, DevOps is a culture change, not just a software methodology. You, if you build it, you own it is the key paradigm of this. So what is the pod? What does a pod consist of? Pod consists of a, a set of uh, engineers and managers who are dedicated to uh, the idea of building a product. So it's a product centric model where we have a product owner or a product manager uh, who occupies the central roles and who drive the key um, priorities of the organization. And the dev team itself contains both dev and ops. And this is a key change 
from traditional software organizations. So given this uh, team structure, what Capgemini has evolved as a technique is to provide these pods as a service, not onboard the individual uh, members of these teams, but actually onboard the pod itself. And it's a significant accelerator, A, because some of these teams already have worked in this agile fashion before, and they're able to de develop and deliver software much faster. It's a key uh, advantage that we offer to our customer. And the second accelerator I wanted to talk to you guys about is, is our DevOps, DevSecOps acceleration platform. Generally, uh, if you look at CNCF or any foundation that looks into cloud native application, there's a huge proliferation of tools. There's thousands of companies and each of them building a couple of tools at least to address this cloud native space. Uh, it is true that cloud native solves the agility problem, but it is also true that it brings with it a lot of complexity. And in order to manage this complexity, you need to have a core set of tools and you need to have a core set of processes in place in order to run this smoothly. Companies like Netflix um, have mastered this and have published articles on how to manage this. And for all the other organizations, we have built a DevSecOps platform, which takes some of these core components in CI, CD, CM, and put together a core set of tools. And we automate this process so that our customers don't have to go through this learning uh, by spending time and cycle. This is a significant accelerator. Uh, you just from get go, you will be at level three maturity in terms of your Dev DevSecOps platform. And having said this, this is amenable to all kinds of uh, applications, be it traditional, uh, be it uh, cloud native on containers, or be it pure serverless. This is agnostic to a specific platform or approach. Uh, the last uh, cloud accelerator that we have as Capgemini is called a digital cloud platform. It's actually uh, years of experience spending uh, time developing software for various of our customers in different segments. We have created a set of blueprints. Right? If you want to do an e-commerce platform, for example, you don't have to start from scratch. We have built all the core modules and created them almost as deployable APIs. And all you as our customer need to focus on is either extending those services or building your own additional services that are actually key value add for you. Just like how serverless takes away uh, infrastructure related heavy lifting away from you, this digital cloud platform takes away all the common features like shopping cart, for example, common features that you will need to implement, but you don't have to if it's already there. We cover it for you. You just focus on your business logic. You focus on your key advantages. And therefore, together, we can go to market much, much, much sooner, much faster. We see a 30 to 50% acceleration in adoption of cloud native uh, using this platform for our customers. Great points. Well, that's about all the time we have for today's webcast. I want to give a big thanks to our speakers, Ravi Ganta of Capgemini and Matt Braley Berger of AWS for sharing their expertise and insights with us. And thanks especially to you, our viewers, for tuning in. Please be sure to check out the resources section on your console for links to some valuable Capgemini resources. Also, if you have a question or comment about this webcast, just type it into the Q&A box in your console and press the submit button. We'll get back to you with an answer within a few days. For Capgemini and IDG, I'm Tom Schmidt.